All right, we're live. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon from a balmy, uh, luckily balmy, Stellenbosch in the Western Cape. Uh, if you're watching this internationally in the southernmost tip of South Africa, I'm joined today by David Rogers, founder of BankX and CEO, together with our CIO from Simple Capital, Blake Musgrove, battling load shedding in the beautiful town of, uh, is it Salt Lake, uh, Blake, I believe? Salt Rock. Salt Rock, not Salt Lake. There we go. Um, just while we give everyone an opportunity to log in and just before we make formal introductions, you've got two QR codes on screen. And for everyone with a smart device, what you're able to do is hover over these QR codes. A message will pop up uh, on the left-hand side to express your interest if you find this opportunity as exciting as we do. And on the right-hand side, even though this is a digital broadcast, we do endeavor to keep this a two-way conversation. And so digitally, you're able to converse with us. I've got a screen here on my left-hand side, so it looks like I'm looking away. This is where the live feed for questions posed for that right-hand side QR code pops up on my screen, um, at which point we'll be able to bring them into the conversation in real time. So please don't hold back. And in as much as this is a digital conversation, let's do try to make it a two-way conversation and get your questions answered, which is the main thing. As per usual, we do have a guideline framework that we've prepared for this expose of BankX. Uh, and we'll follow that, but we're quite happy to jump off piste into questions that you might have that facilitate your better understanding of the opportunity. So again, QR code, hover it left-hand side. That's the direct start of the investment process to express your interest. And on the right-hand side, please also scan that one uh, to join the WhatsApp group that feeds live to me that enables Q&A in real time. Uh, for the purposes of the recording, if we go to the next slide, there is a disclaimer. This is colloquially known as CYA. And so we've ticked that box. Please do make sure that you are, in fact, uh, familiarized with some of the disclaimers uh, as pertains to industry standard. All right. Um, from an agenda perspective, on the next slide, uh, what we've done is to curate this framework of conversation. So we'll do the quick welcome now, uh, get you introduced to our panelists, subsequent to which we'll delve into some of the meat that sits around Bank X and the nature of the opportunity. We'll end off with two sections, being the unveiling of the deal structure and the different options that you will be presented with, together with an Ask Us Anything section. And this is where David sits in the hot seat. Uh, it's entirely unscripted, and you can throw anything at him um, that you need in order to further your understanding of the opportunity. All right, so with that being said, let's formally get introductions. If you haven't met me before, uh, hello, my name is Philip van der Post. I am the chairman and the co-founder of Simple Capital. With me today is, from our team side, Blake Musgrove, who is our CIO and a partner in the business. Blake, nice to have you. Not from Salt Lake, but in fact from Salt Rock. And we know that you're battling load shedding and infrastructural challenges. So thanks very much for joining and making the time available today. Nice to have you, as always. Thanks, Philip, and hi, everyone. Uh, star of the show today, David Rogers, founder and CEO of BankX. David, I believe that you're sitting somewhere in Gauteng. Is that right? Yep, Willem. And unfortunately, having a, an uncustomarily rainy winter's day, cold and rainy winter's day in, uh, in Johannesburg. There we go. Well, welcome. Uh, thanks very much for taking the time out of running your business to come and talk to investors about what this opportunity entails. Um, and then for investors, just on our next slide, again, if you've just joined on the left-hand side, expressing your interest to get going with uh, filling out the form that expresses your interest in this opportunity and helps you quantify it. And on the right-hand side, a WhatsApp group that feeds directly to the machine on my left-hand side that we'll use for two-way engagement throughout the course of this conversation. Now, as per usual, there are some minimum requirements as pertains simple capital structure investing. And I'll hand over to Blake for a second just to talk you through what those minimum requirements are uh, in terms of the regulation that we've got to follow. Blake, over to you. Thanks, Willem, and, and hello, everyone. Um, I'll touch on the various uh, quantum sizes and investment structures at the end of the webinar. But uh, for compliance purposes, we are required to highlight to participating investors the minimum requirements. So if participating via the simple capital structure in the UK, investors will need to meet a self-certification that they are a sophisticated, sophisticated investor in the UK. So what does this mean? Basically, you need to meet 
one of the following criteria. So it's not an and, it's an or. So you need to meet one of the following. So you're a member of a network or syndicate of business angels and have been so for the last six months prior to this date. Uh, you've made more than one private investment into an unlisted company in the last two years prior than today's date. You are working or have worked in the last two years in the financial services sector, uh, in private equity, the provision of finance uh, for SMEs. And you are currently all within the last two years of investing or today's date have been a director of a company with a turnover over a million pounds. If you do have any questions, please can you reach out to me directly and we'll just clarify whether you meet these criteria. Re reminder, it is a self-certification. Willem, back to you. Brilliant. Black, thank you very much. With our T's and C's crossed, then let's change gears and David, get you straight into the unveiling here. First of all, tell us about who you are and this team that you've assembled that runs Bank X. Um, important for our investors to know who they're dealing with. Yeah, thanks, Willem. Um, yeah, I'm uh, Dave Rogers. I've, uh, I've sort of come through a bit of a, a circuitous route to where I am, um, having got a computer's degree and a law undergrad degree, and then finally uh, deciding that I hate accountancy, but becoming a CASA, a chartered accountant. Um, and I've worked in a number of different industries, all in the telecoms, um, financial services, uh, software type spaces. Um, and I founded um, what is today Bank X um, way back in 2003. Um, and Bank X is effectively an iteration of that, which um, got established in 2016. Um, and as such, I've got a, a long-standing team, and we've worked together over many years. Um, you know, some of us uh, have worked together for the last 10, 12 years. And um, the organization has typically had around 40 to 50 people. That's been our, our sort of um, size. And... Um, decades of banking, software, and financial services experience, all really relevant to, to what BankX does today. David, and um, the on screen now is your executive team by the looks of the uh, headings that you've got underneath them, but you just made mention the total team size, in fact, extends beyond what we see on screen. You've got about 50 people, is that right? Yeah, so I mean, um, there's also it's like some sense of virtualization. So we've got, um, yes. you know, we've got like a legal team that that isn't in house, but is on retainer. And so there's a, a number of different legal uh, people that we might use for different areas, whether it be getting tax advice or um, IFRS accounting or um, whatever it might be from the legal side. And the same in the in the corporate side in our finance department. So there's there's some virtual resources, and I think that that that's sort of in the I'd call it the peripheral services side. Um, and then in our core team, yeah, we've got about um, de developers, business analysts, testers, DevOps people is the core of the business. And that, yeah, that certainly numbers around the 30. Okay. All right. Brilliant. Thank you for that. Um, and then, I mean, to the meat of this, what does Bank X do? Tell us about your vision, the problem that you solve, and a little bit of the landscape around that. Let's just unveil this. Yeah, great. Thanks. Um, yeah, so the vision is is really to be the leader in providing a business-to-business -business white label platform and providing embedded finance and banking as a service to Africa, which is our sort of target geography and where we've sort of grown up, um, as well as other emerging markets. And and certainly that's that's the vision um, as we stand today. There's there's larger aspirational visions, you know, take over the universe. But I think we've got to start where where we know and understand. And so we're going to focus on Africa and emerging markets. Um, to your question about the problem we solve. So <laughs> financial services and software are two incredibly complicated spaces um, because of the rate of change, um, the complexity of change, and the regulation. And bringing all of those together is a problem. So what BankX does is that in managing that, um, there's a lot of pain and, and importantly risk in managing the building and integration of technology obtaining the necessary licensing, managing ongoing compliance, um, and the delivery of software and all the infrastructure around that that's necessary to deliver a financial product. So what we do is we take all of that and we replace that pain with a managed service. And that'll be the embedded finance API first approach that I'll discuss, I'm sure, a little bit later, um, as well as bringing you the licensing um, as a bank as a service uh, component. Okay. Um, 
I do know that we've also got some visuals that help understand everything that you've just said, which is quite an array of things that you're solving. But let's just put some pictures to that and perhaps talk our investors through how the nuts and the bolts fit together. It is that platform architecture slide. Yeah, that's that's great. Thanks. And I, I, I'll talk to that. And I think I think what I'll do is I'll also talk to some of the key differentiators that um, that the platform has or that Bank X has. So um, just thematically, we've got a modern API first approach. So we've built our platform, not the way that a traditional monolith legacy architecture would have been built, but it's been built on a on an API first approach. And that really allows you through currently over 250 APIs that allow embedded finance to be delivered. And it's a differentiator because of the breadth and depth of our functionality across those APIs in a full value chain. And that talks to a single platform that brings that value chain of pre-integrated services together. And that will allow a fast launch configuration and scalability as well as extensibility of the platform in an end-to-end -end value chain. So what we do is we bring 50 plus systems together and no other providers have got that depth in our market. And um, I think that that's an important key differentiator for us. And I'll, I'll talk to that in the architecture. Obviously, our emerging market presence, experience and focus, we've been selling into LATAM um, in Africa, right from Nigeria and Ghana in, in West Africa to the DRC, um, Zambia, Tanzania, Uganda, um, and then down into the southern tip to, to Mozambique, Botswana, South Africa, Namibia, you know, just to give you a sense of, of what that is. And um, as I said, Mexico and, and um, Colombia in, in, in LATAM. Um, another, another sort of differentiator that I'll talk to is our fast start front ends. It's a completely separate product. It's built, um, and I'll talk to that in the, in the slide in the moment, it's built to allow a fast start. So there are competitors and people who do an API first approach the problem with an API first approach is that sometimes companies can't get started until they've built their own front end and channels or modernized and got on their, on their digital delivery journey. But we can give them both. We can give them the ability to be flexible and where they start enabling that capability to use APIs and where they haven't got the capability to use our front end. And finally, we've got a best of breed fintech technology platform. Um, and basically, let me, let me just say I would call it where others want to go. So if you look at the value chain that we support, right, we start right at the product factory. So this is really our customers are enabled to manufacture a product for their own customer. So not the way that a bank or a lender or a payment provider wants to offer it because it's optimal for them, but for our B2B customer, what makes the most sense for them? What product, what, what rules, configuration, parameters are important in building and manufacturing a lending product, a payment product, a wallet product, um, an investment product, um, how does that all tie together? And how do you bring that together in a value proposition for your customer? So the end-to-end -end value chain is how you deliver it, but it all starts at that manufacturer. So we've got almost um, you know, product as configuration where you can very, very easily through our APIs configure your product or do it through our, our front end um, as well. And then through the value chain that a financial services organization has to go through, you've got to onboard customers. And this is, you know, the digital journey of biometrics and optical character recognition and doing digital signatures and getting sanction screening, KYC information, all of the stuff that you typically want to do when you're trying to figure out who it is that I'm getting as a customer. Later, you want to get to account opening. What kind of product am I offering a customer and what are the regulations that apply to that? And or what are the business processes I want to go through? Um, and information I want to glean in order to open a product. So opening an investment product or getting a loan, they've got different, they've got different categories. Then we go through the origination process and the product factory that, that, that fits inside there. And that's the journey that you might go through. So a journey for selecting an investment product might be um, how much do you want to invest for how long it's a notice investment. I want to give you 90 days notice. I want to invest a million pounds. Um, and, um, I wanted to take it from my existing current account, or I'm going to send it to you from, from, an, from an external account. What are the processes? What are the T's and C's that you need to go through? In lending, it'll be very different. It'll be um, in retail lending, um, what's your affordability? Are you compliant? 
um, you know, from, from that, like what, what are the approvals we need um, to go and do credit bureau integrations and calling and who do I want to go through in the four eyes, you know, credit factory to originate your product. So that whole process, I want to give you an offer and acceptance. Maybe there's a little bit of negotiation. Um, and then finally giving you a, a product to sign and I'm only going to originate it on dispersal. And do I want to do that automatically? Um, do I want to go through a different release process? So all of these are the, the, the origination process and the product factory that we, are, that we provide for the different products. And then finally you get into servicing and servicing can be like, you know, very simple in a, let's call it the happy path world where nothing goes wrong and people don't change their mind. Um, so we've got a, a load shedding um, thing going on um, or go through account servicing where, um, you know, in lending, all sorts of crazy things happen. You know, people restructure, refinance, they miss payments and you've got to allocate, you know, capital first and interest and penalties and all sorts of things. So how do you take the product from its inception right through the account servicing to wind down and closure of the product? So that's the value chain. And we provide that full breadth for all of those product types that I'm talking about, effectively lending, transacting or saving or investing. So across that value chain. And then we bring in, the, in our APIs, we bring all of that together, 50 plus integrated services, all using um, event streaming. So it's all real time. There's none of this day end batch processing. I don't know how much I've earned as a business until the end of the month and the month end process is run. All of this is real time. Um, it can be streamed into the cloud. So you can use machine learning and AI capabilities that exist in the cloud. Um, all the personalization we deploy into the cloud. So we cloud um, agnostic, we can deploy to any cloud provider. And because of our technology, we can also do hybrid cloud. This is very important where you've got sovereign regulation, where you cannot, um, in the, not all territories have got a cloud provider in country. And as such, you know, you might have Saudi Arabia doesn't want you to put customer master data or transactional data in an Azure data center in Ireland. It has to be in Saudi mm -hmm. Arabia, but Azure aren't in Saudi Arabia. So possibly that's something that um, we need to put on premise and we can do both. Um, and then finally, all of those events um, can, be, can be streamed. Um, into external um, integration points. So we're integrated into card networks or national payment systems or some compliance environment or simply a data lake. So we bring all of that capability together across that value chain, 50 integrated systems. So it's pre-integrated. So there's none of this usual process that an enterprise who we sell to typically goes through. You have to go through an RFI, RFP process you got to select a vendor, then you've got to try and figure out which of these 50 vendors work together to deliver your solution. Then you've got to go into project management and you're going to figure out when can you get a slot to integrate. And that's why these become multi-year projects for enterprises to deliver product to market to the man in the street. And in a fast moving market, um, time is money, time is market share, mm. time is everything. So with a single platform, we can give you that full value chain with all of those services pre-integrated, ready to go. Then we've got our marketplace partners where we use best of breed. So how are you going to do biometrics and sanction screening and um, bureau calls in Kenya is very different to how you're going to do it in South Africa, which would be different to Saudi Arabia, which would be different to Mongolia. So we work with best of breed uh, marketplace providers and we pre-integrate them into the platform. And once they're in, you get that same benefit of a single platform. So that's, that's, I hope that, that, that gives you a picture. Look, it's, it's complex and it's obviously extremely comprehensive because you span the entire value chain. I suppose a question that pops up for me is, do I need to buy the entire value chain from you or am I able to pick the bits and pieces that I want because I might consider myself best of breed in one of those links in the value chain? Yeah, so that's a, so that's a, great, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, no, you don't. You can pick and choose. Um, so, so really, we, you know, if you if you go back to that architecture, any one of those fifty systems, you you can you can say that um, customer master data needs to reside in country, or you can say um, we want to use Salesforce as our CRM. So, and then it will integrate into into a Salesforce adapter, and you can have everything on us, and you can have Salesforce as your CRM. And likewise, on the front end, and and uh, if Courtney, if you'll go back to that to that architecture diagram. Um, you'll see that the front end, you could have CRM, ERP, billing, website on the top of the screen. All of those APIs, all of those systems that you yourself choose, you can have any one of our systems that are inside our block. And those are just 20 of 55 services, um, so to avoid clutter. Um, you can have 
any or all of those combinations. And you can have a front end that speaks to one or many of those, or you can use our rapid implementation fast start front end or a combination because it's all driven by RESTful JSON APIs. Okay, and so perhaps an obvious one, but if you have two customers that have very different front ends or would have desires for very different front ends, uh, but they haven't, they haven't built them themselves, you and your team will deploy with best of breed resource in order to construct that front end that is so part of the differentiation, I suppose, per brand. Yeah, so, so typically what happens is um, the brand wants the UX and the UI. They really want to control through their app or through their website or whatever um, billing processes or engines that they've got currently in place. So they want to integrate that into our platform. So we have many customers who've got very, very different front ends. In fact, none of them have got the same front end. And even if they had the same Salesforce front end as an example, Salesforce itself would have been configured differently and talked to our services potentially in a different way. So um, that's the beauty of what we have. And, it, and it's the future proof and comfort from a technology that customers now get from us that um, you don't have to buy the whole thing. If you've made a mistake or you want to hollow out your own core mm. and replace it like service by service, you can certainly do that with us. Okay, so what I'm hearing is a lot of flexibility in the tailoring of which aspects a buyer of yours consumes and buys your product, which of course then, I mean, that just opens up the world for potential clients because uh, it's yeah. not someone that has to take the full stack from you. It might be someone that takes a part of the stack. So let's just talk about the size of the prize here for a second. I think that's on our next slide. Yeah, so the size of the prize. So uh, this is a massive... It's a massive opportunity. It's a massive TAM, right? So people are talking about $7.2 trillion market. Um, and that's banking as a service, um, embedded financial services, right? So, so this is exactly where you're now giving a brand the access to manufacture and insert themselves into the value chain that has traditionally been owned by banks or lenders. And the, the, the brand themselves now are starting to get a revenue stream and sharing with a bank X in that revenue stream um, in providing a financial product. So if you think about it, in the, the like a simple term, in the old days, you wanted to buy a car, um, you'd walk into Ferrari and say, I love that Ferrari, I want to buy it. And Ferrari would say, great, that's going to be $2 million, please. You go, oh, hang on a second, I've got to go to the bank. You'd leave the dealership, off to the bank you go, and you go through a lending process about how you're going to get the financing for the car. Um, you know, that, that, that process is going to be that the, the motor dealership loses out. Today's motor yes. dealerships have started to solve this problem. And the areas where it's really been solved the best are uh, mortgages and car finance, where Audi or Ferrari, they've got their own financial services arm because they're trying to make that seamless embedded journey possible. And they're injecting themselves into that financing component. Now, if you extend that metaphor across every single industry and every single product that gets consumed, then you're starting to understand how each of those brands are going to have access to this, to this market mm -hmm. and we're going to have a banking as a service provider player piece in that market. I think that's such an important differentiator because I mean, every time we see a pitch deck from a, a entrepreneur that's evangelistic about this product, then we see trillion. Then uh, we immediately start to say, Ooh, is this pie in the sky? But essentially the enablement of financially um, serviced product sales yeah. is, is, is anyone who wants to provide that sort of facility to customers. And I suppose that's why this thing's measured in the trillions and not in the, you know, denominations yeah. lower than that. Does this mean that my, that my buyer uh, of the bank X product still needs to go through FSP registration, uh, credit licenses, and that sort of regulatory hurdles? How does that work? It's region by region dependent. Um, it's regulatory in nature. Um, certainly in the more financially advanced regulatory environments, yes, you absolutely do. Um, and because ultimately you're the brand and you're going to be um, offering this. What we do for you is that if you, you then let me get like a, like a simple example is um, if, if you wanted to offer your customers a investment product as part of a 
loyalty scheme. You're going to say every time you buy a Ferrari, uh, okay, well, maybe that's a bad example because I'm sure you're not buying many Ferraris, but every time you bought a Ferrari, we're going to give you um, 10% of your purchase into an investment account, um, which you'll earn this amount of interest in, and you can redeem it in the following ways and subject to this. And when you bring in your car and you trade it in, some product that someone has thought about that actually appeals to buyers of Ferrari. To be able to offer an investment account, effectively, um, you've got to be a bank. Um, mm -hmm. And we take care of all of that for you. you will, we will be the bank for you, but you will offer the product. And yes, there is some compliance bits and pieces that we need to take care of, but you don't have to go and get a bank license, which is several hundred to billions that need to be spent to obtain it. Um, we're doing that for you. And then you don't have to worry about, again, like what problem are we solving? We're getting the license for you. We're looking after the compliance. We're rolling out the technology, all of that pain that you would have to do just so you could make some money on a, on, on, on financial service on a product that you're selling. Okay, superb, which actually then is the perfect segue to get us to how does this business model work and the go-to-market, which I know is also the next slide. Um, and that just perhaps simplifies uh, this complex value chain that you've now essentially turned into banking as a service, not to uh, do any disservice to the complexity of what you've offered here, but simplistically put, we're talking about banking as a service here, right? Yeah, so that, that, that's right. And, and, I, and I guess the... The key thing that you've said there is, yes, you've taken a very, very complex environment and we have tried to simplify it. So in a sense, we're saying, don't worry about any of that. Tell us what kind of accounts do you want? How many of our 55 systems do you need? What kind of service level do you want us to provide you? Now, depending on the product, some of that's regulated and some of it you get to choose. So there's sometimes it's a regulatory minimum. You can go higher. I want five, nine availability, active, active, disaster recovery and business continuity planning infrastructure, blah, 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 um, X amount of storage. So you size it, we provide it. Um, and then sometimes there's a per transaction element because we're acting as, as the bank and, the, and the, you know, for our overseas customers, a payfac, a payment facilitator or a TPPP is what it's known as in, uh, in South Africa. Um, so that's our model. You get to choose. Um, it's offered on a on a monthly basis, and it's pay as you grow basis. So there's a sub minimum. We've got to make sure that our that our customers wash their face. This isn't a grow at any cost um, business. Um, we um, we've always built like businesses that that have to that have to wash their face, and every product and every customer has got to be profitable and and make money and have legs um, that they can grow to scale. So that's who we target. But you you come to us and you say, I need a million accounts. I need twenty million accounts. Um, I want these services, I want lending, and I want payments, and a wallet, and I want buy now, pay later, I want earned wage access, you know, or whatever it is that you require from us, and I need 5.9 availability, and, uh, and we negotiate what, what the per transaction cost is for, you know, uh, payments that, that need to happen outside of transactional accounts or whatever it might be. Um, there's a once-off setup fee on implementation, um, and that's very dependent upon the customer and what they're selecting from us. And then we, we, we OEM in effectively our marketplace partners where you want to, where they typically charge you on a per account or per transaction basis. And our model is I'm never having an argument with my customer about why I need to charge 10 cents more for something than they could get it if they went direct to our marketplace partner. So our agreement with our marketplace partner is what that customer can get from you is what we charge them. So we're a facilitator in that. Um, sometimes we, we, through scale, we get, we, we get economies that each individual customer won't get. So we'll make money on that. Um, but no customers, I'm not ever having the fight about, well, hang on, I'm not going to get it through you because I can get it cheap if I go direct. Yeah, wrong argument to have with your customer. And what I really like what you said there, uh, you know, was the legs and the washing of face. We've seen growth at all costs. Uh, diminish so many great value propositions. Um, and I think we're in the era now, post the collapse of VC, where due diligence and uh, road to profitability is back in fashion. So I'm very happy that you touched on that. We'll come to the plan in a sec. Uh, just zooming out a little bit. So this is your business model. This is the problem that you solve. This is the enablement you offer to the market. You must have a lot and at the same time, no competitors. Uh, so <laughs> talk to us about the competitive landscape. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. And when you look at when you look at the markets we service, right? So whether they be banks, lenders, fintechs, retailers, and and mobile network operators, you can see that 
in all of those spaces, there'll be some some level of competitor. So let me talk let me talk specifically in Africa and somewhat to emerging markets that there's there's currently no competitors that we bump heads against in the sense of being able to have the bank as a service license and offering the full range of capabilities across all the services that we offer on on a, on a future proof tech stack. Um, so that's very important. We 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 don't really come across them. Um, you can get competitors where if you look at an individual service we offer or collection of services we may offer. So maybe so you could say, well, there are loan management service providers. Yes, there are, um, but they may not do loan origination and they don't do document storage and management and they don't do decisioning engines and they don't, and they don't, et cetera, all the other 50 systems. And you might have a loan origination system, but they don't do loan management. So you might have a core banking provider, but they don't provide the front end. And, and, and so as you start to go across that there are there are frighteningly few people, funnily enough, that um, that we that we actually have competitors with. Um, if you were to look at like um, bankers as a service providers in other territories, like a, a Solaris Bank in Europe out of Germany would be a very interesting one to to look at. Um, they used similar technology to us um, when we started and they started, um, and they've got their banking license and they target. Um, retail, um, typically what, you know, like what they do. So, so that will give you a sense of who a competitor would be. And if you're looking at, at our markets to, to try and ascertain whether there's a competitor, certainly in each individual service or maybe a little aggregation of services, we have some competitors, but we haven't come across any that have got the breadth that we have. And that's because we've been building for since 2014, but really 2016 in earnest, um, and we've invested, you know, um, a significant amount of capital already in the in the build process. Sure. Okay. And so, with the capital invested into this solution, with this competitive landscape, what's the traction been? We we see so many uh, conversations in which there's a spreadsheet that shows you know, billions at the end, but to substantiate that with traction stats. Talk to us a little bit about some of the successes and the market traction <laughs> that you've had to date. Yeah, and uh, and by the way, Willem, don't think that I haven't got that spreadsheet. I've got it um, <laughs> as well. Um, you have to have it, right? Um, of course. So, 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 you know, if you really want to talk about the traction, so yeah, we started building in 2016. We wound down an old business that was the previous um, business that we had in terms of building this and we really focused and invested a significant amount of time effort and money um, in building and unfortunately for us we had an anchor tenant a pan-african banking and lending um, group um, we launched into COVID, and that group who was going to be our anchor unfortunately failed and um, through COVID, and a lot of other customers too that we had lined up so we really had to do quite a big reboot um, through the first year of COVID, and we got our first customer only in December 2020, having launched in March, um, you know, sort of officially. And then over the ensuing period, we've we've gained about 12 customers. Um, and really, what that was doing was proving in each segment we 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 targeted banks, lenders, fintech retailers, and mobile network operators or virtual mobile network operators. We wanted to prove that we had a solution that we could take to market and get live, um, and we did that across 12 customers. Um, through that segment, we had a customer, at least a customer in every one of those segments. Um, our focus now, having done that over the last just over two years, is rationalizing customers that are subscale. And we're now only focusing and dealing with mid to top end enterprises, you know, large listed entities, et cetera, that have got the legs to grow to scale, that are really the best fit and best bang for buck for our effort um, and return thereon. So some other sort of milestones and traction that we've got um, besides customers is um, we're a Microsoft managed partner. We've become a PayFAC or a TPPP in, uh, in our local market. Um, we've got what's called a, a GN5 underway. So that's where the, the central bank, um, the South African Reserve Bank, is going through a process with our sponsor bank to certify us as a core system. Um, inside the national payment systems of, uh, of of our local market in South Africa, um, and part of what we will use our funds for is to complete and finalise that process. Um, and we've got um, several digital, um, like boutique 
go to market partners that we've established with. So yes, Microsoft, um, we're working closely with their enterprise sales teams in the fintech vertical, um, in the financial services vertical, and then the guys like AT Carney or Capco, those sorts of um, specialist boutique consulting houses that have really got the ear of these large corporates and are building out the McKinsey's of the world, building out the strategy for those organizations and how they evolve into this embedded finance journey and the digitization, seamless, frictionless customer journeys. Um, and we're partnering with those organizations and getting quite a few leads now starting to come through as we start to mature. So that's a lot of the traction um, you know, a, a, across a broad range that we've, that we've managed to achieve. Thanks that's quite a bit of to the, to the depth and breadth of what we've built. Sure, sure. Uh, David, I mean, to, just to commend you also, it takes a lot of courage to rationalize clients where I think a lot of early stage opportunities see enterprise scrambling for any customer. And to be convinced of your value chain to the extent such that you're willing to rationalize customers um, certainly does talk to a confidence in the product. Um, yeah. And of course, that confidence at some point, as we had said, there's a model that sits behind this. And at some point, you've got to return cash to investors. So when do you think, what is, what's required? Give us sort of the abridged version of uh, cash generation, washing your own face, um, sort of a three-year model, if you like. Yeah. Um, so the reason we're confident um, is because of the conversations that we're having in the market. Um, if we weren't, we certainly wouldn't be rationalizing anyone. Um, we, we clearly understand that we've got significant interest from very large enterprises um, that are looking to play in this space. And it's, it's off the back of that that we're very happy to rationalize down and really only focus on the customers that are going to have the most legs and that have got the ability to allow us to um, invest in them. And likewise, how they will continue to invest and grow their position with bank X. So um, as I said, we've, we've, we've got that spreadsheet, that billions spreadsheet. Um, that's our model. That model is something that I think we'll focus on more for the series A, series B journey. That's where you've got enough capital behind you to start really focusing on that true growth phase um, to, to achieve those numbers. And it's a very detailed model. And um that, that, that goes to the business of being a bank as a service provider and having the funding to go out and grow into those different markets. So what I'm, what I'm showing you here is that um, from where we stand today, based on the conversations we're having and the, and the deals that we're in the process of closing, um, we believe that over the next three years, we're going to grow quite considerably from somewhere around a 40 million revenue in, in South African rands to well over 206 million in three years time. And that's with a very, very, I would almost call it non-existent, let me say ultra, ultra conservative transactional element to what we're doing. Um, and that, that, that'll that result in about an 18 to 24 month profitability, both on an IFRS or cash modeling basis. And so what we've done here is we've really looked at what the funding runway on a cash basis on our evolving um, forward pipeline um, looks like and this is and, and this really talks to talk to that journey so the path to profitability is critically important for me remember Willem, i'm running a mini bank so mm. my burn is big and it can't it can't go on we've got to really focus on making sure that we get to profitability um and um, especially you know in, in the markets where we've typically raised from and where we play you want to make sure that you've got the ability to get to profitability um, in, a, in, a, in a fairly reasonable time, and that then you can go after the, the big, hairy, audacious goal of really being that leader in Africa. And that's part of what our Series A, and I guess ultimately will be like a Series B round will be. So we're going to get into um, what funding uh, looks like for you and uh, what the application of that funding will be, but perhaps just a, a comment on the model. I mean, one can model until you're blue in the face, but as a SaaS business inherently, you are actually very subject to big swing and miss, specifically given the complexity of your value chain. And if you have a buyer that buys the entire value chain from you versus 10 smaller clients that perhaps buy segments of the value chain, this, this model that we're looking at here might fundamentally change if you have a whale that lands. Yes. <laughs> 
Um, stuff thing to very, model. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 really difficult. Um, enterprise sales are long. Um, yes. You know, our our longest has been three years. Um, funnily enough, we've got a global player that's really been four months. Um, and I was hoping to have, by the time I had this this webinar, the the contracts in hand, so I could sort of name names. But um, we've we've we're very very close. The global player they operate in forty five countries. They've selected us. Um, we're going through a POC. We deliver on the POC. Um, we're going to be rolled out to to their global organization. Um, you know, these are the kind of things that 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 are potentially whales. We've got two other big deals signed. I'm waiting for some CPs to. We don't model those. Those aren't in here. Um, because until it happens, it hasn't happened. And we like to take that sort of, I, I'm a chartered accountant. So, you know, in, in as much as that I'm an entrepreneur, there's still that accountant I can't get out of me. And, and, and you have to sort of be much more pragmatic about the reality. And until it's done, it's not done. Um, you know, we can show lots of um, future possibility and like why we're saying that that's real. Um, but until, it's, until that money's in my bank, day one, and I've got that first check has been received, it's not there. So until it's there, it's not there. I must say, I resonate with that comment of the accountant and the entrepreneurial duality. And I'm very, very pleased, David, um, about the fact that this the spreadsheet is not a percentage of TAM, which we often find with inexperienced and perhaps more bushy-eyed, bright-tailed first-round entrepreneurs, of which we know you're not. And it certainly shows in the conservatism that you've built into the numbers, which I think is great. Um, in the interest of time, let's track on. Uh, if we just get rid of the slides for a second, uh, you've mentioned major investment up to this point. Talk to us about some of your uh, current investors. Yeah, so um, I've I've funded the you know the first couple of years of the build, um, and I'd I'd spoken to Invelo Ventures, who um, were the first guys who really got they got Bank X out the box. They understood it, and they're one of the few that that really understood it very early on. And this was in 2020. It took another year um, of me funding the business and them seeing traction before they were invested. Um, but um, today they're they're a very valuable partner. They're um, backed and founded by Capitec Bank, which is the largest retail bank in South Africa by number of customers, um, and 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 a, and a fantastic banking um, South African success story. They've 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 I mean Vela Ventures have now work working very hard with us to um, over a two year period. You talk about sales cycles to start delivering services into Capitec Bank, and I think we're we're tracking very well there. And uh, again, um, until something's done, it's not done, but we're looking very good at being able to, to do something with, uh, w w with substantial with, with the Capitec Bank. Um, and that's really been, a, been through Invela Ventures and they've certainly introduced a lot of other opportunities to us um, and are now working very, very hard on the, let's call it the business development side of making sure that their investment gets a return. Hmm. So, okay, let's do this. I mean, you're selling a vision to investors, and we've had a view of some of the sort of three-year modeling, which of course is an important thing to build in there, show conservatism, that you're realistic about the numbers. But in five years, talk to me yes. about vision, not, not the numbers necessarily. Like, what does this business look like if you do everything that you say you're going to do? So I, I really think that in five years that BankX um, will be the leading provider of bank as a service and embedded finance in Africa and potentially even in uh, emerging markets um that's that's the vision that's what you're buying into if you buy into if you understand that technology is changing that um people people are are wanting and demanding anytime anywhere um seamless frictionless delivery of products um that are digitally enabled and api first and flexible and configurable quick times to market if you buy into that thesis then you buy in, you buy into the embedded journey and you buy into in banking as a service and backing a bank X, we execute properly. We will be the leader. Which leads me to the conversation that you and I had prior to this webinar, David, where you spoke of bank X as a de-risked investment. And of course uh, I had to query you about that because as a venture capital investor, we, we look for risks. Now you're telling me it's de-risk. Uh, 
But perhaps just your view and for investors to get a closer feel of the philosophy that you imbued and that you lead. Why do you say that this is a de-risk investment? So I think, you know, certainly we can have a debate about venture capital and um, what, what stage in a business VC plays. Um, I tend to find that the reality is that we, t- we tend to find VC dressed up as PE, you know, sort of private equity. You know, yes. they want you to solve all the world's problems, already be cash flow positive and profitable, and then they want to invest as a VC. Um, <laughs> Some of the other, some of the other more true VC um, funders are like, you know, on the back of a PowerPoint, are giving people ten million dollars and saying, "Go for it." Um, why is this de-risked in that concept? Is that we've already spent circa, let's call it twenty million dollars, has been invested today. So you're coming in after that money's already been spent. The platform's been built. The depth and breadth is already there. It's in production. We've got product market fit in each of the segments we're talking about. We've got large B2B customers now coming on to the platform um, through our pipeline maturing. Um, and we're operating, um, have the potential to operate not just in South Africa, evidenced by two or three other deals that we're signing in countries outside of South Africa, but certainly through Africa and, and, and the world. So, you know, from that perspective, you're, you're, you're I believe, completely de risk compared to a, a very traditional angel or VC investment. Okay. Also, again, comforting to hear that the diminishing of risk does not necessarily talk to a diminished return perspective here. So it's not a lukewarm investment we're talking about here. Still super exciting. Um, massive TAM. Great team. If all of this resonates with investors and they say, okay, this sounds great. Can you shed some light on what you're going to use the money for? Yeah, so I think, Willem, um, what's been true of our journey and, and certainly the, let's call it the investor journey outside of myself as, as, a, as, a, as an investor in the business um, has really been about um, being, being around because we, we're getting the traction. So the, the funds that we're looking to raise now are more of a bridge in nature and that's why we're looking to a safe A because we believe that we're on the verge of being able to demonstrate the conversion of our pipeline. And that's taken a long time and sometimes longer than we projected um, and, and want, but it's, it's been a reality of those, of those sales cycles. And it can be anywhere from three years to four months. Um, so we want to do a safe because we want, we need bridging funding to get us to get across some of these milestones. And once those are done, then a series, a sort of a priced round is much more appropriate than it would be now where I don't think we're going to, we're going to, talk to investors and get the value. Um, and I think rightly so, we can have a conversation about, you know, how you value the business. But I think, you know, going beyond that, I, I think really, really does help. Um, so we want to use it as a bridge. Um, and what we want to do in the next sort of six months that we want to have the bridge in place is complete our GN5 process with the Reserve Bank, the central bank in South Africa. That process is in midstream. It's been going for about a year and a half. Um, we're at the death now. We need to get into the certification and the actual more work has got to be done um, as part of that process. And that should take us about four months. Um, working capital, just general working capital to to keep running the business, continue platform um, investment because we, you know, the platform is, is as much as there's a lot of breadth and depth, you, you're you going to continue to build software. Um, this will be a journey um, that continues. And um, I think effectively trying to assist making sure that we've got the working capital to assist us in proof of concepts where you want to be able to get over the line from a sales perspective by doing something that maybe doesn't wash its face to the customer in order to win the business. So that's, so that's effectively what, we, what we're going to use the funds for. Okay. Fantastic. Uh, David, I mean, I'm excited about the opportunity. Uh, to people tuned into this webinar, I would say if you're excited about this opportunity, remember that we've got this QR code that you can scan. Uh, that takes you to an expression of interest form, and that starts to facilitate your process of investment, at which point probably your next question is, what does the investment structure uh, look like? What are the quantums like? David did mention that there is some negotiation capability when the quantums warrant them. And so bringing back Blake... Um, while we let David take a sip of water after all all of that expose, uh, Blake, could I ask you to talk us through the investment overview uh, for investors that are interested, please? You're on mute, I believe.
No, I can see you. I don't know if it's just me, David. Have you got uh, Blake's audio? No. No. Okay, so it's not just me. Let's just give Blake another sort of 30 seconds just to figure out with uh, load shedding what's happened to his audio. He's probably going to just drop off um, and then make it back in. For our American and European and Australian investors, uh, load shedding is in fact when the state turns off our power. It's probably the only uh, utility in the world that asks its consumers to use less of its product so that it can survive. But it does wreak havoc in some of these live uh, sessions that we have. I see Blake is back. Let's see if he's you guys hear me? in. You're back, sir, and it's all over right. to you. All right. Amazing what a quick refresh can do. Um, <laughs> great. So, uh, Bank X is the trading name of Radix Financial Software PTY Limited, is, which is the entity in which investors will be investing into. It is currently domiciled in South Africa. However, there is a board mandate for a re domicile to a European jurisdiction. Um, in the short to medium term, uh, we're looking at this this uh, bridge funding 69 months, a quantum of 1.5 million dollars. Uh, this is ahead of the the broader Series A transaction, which will be a priced equity round upon Bank X hitting the milestones which Dave has touched on. Um, there are three potential tranches of investment, and I'll touch on the simple capital structure first. So as Simple Capital, we lower the ticket sizes available for uh, sophisticated investors to invest in exciting opportunities such as Bank X. Um, for a minimum investment quantum of 25,000, uh, you will come through the Simple Capital structure, which is in the UK, which I'll touch on on the next slide. The deal is a safe note uh, at a 20% discount to the Series A valuation that will be negotiated with the lead investor. And what's clear is that uh, there is a relatively short time to conversion of this safe note, which will result in an uplift of your investment and hence the reason or the attractiveness for investors to come in now into the bridge. Should you invest north of $100,000, there's an opportunity to come direct onto the Bank X cap stack, again, through a safe note, 20% discount, but without coming through the simple capital structure um, and uh, without a fee base on that, on that structure. You'll come direct onto uh, the Bank X um, cap stack. For investors north of a million dollars, uh, a bespoke structure can be negotiated. There are B shares available, which means that you become an equity holder directly on the cap stack, uh, as opposed to coming into safe notes and then converting at the next price round. So valuation to be nego negotiated with individual uh, invest investment parties looking at north of a million dollars. If you just go to the next slide, touching on the first option, um, touching on the first option for smaller investors, um, we offer a, a structure which is based in the UK. The legal entity is Simple Capital Limited. It is the investment company. Um, the entity manager is Simple Capital Partners Limited. Um, what will happen is a type Z preference share will be issued to investors in increments of $1,000. Uh, so 25000 investment, 25 sh preference shares. There will be a 5% upfront fee, uh, which will be paid above the principal um, that the investor contributes. There will be no ongoing annual management fees. And then there is a performance fee. Once you've received your initial capital plus your fees back, then the splits of the economics will be 90% to the investor and 10% and to, to simple capital. Please, Thanks. yeah, Thank I mean, you. hopefully I've given a good overview there. Uh, please reach out to me if there are any further questions from the structure. Back to you, Vidim. Brilliant. Like, thank you very much. And as always, making light of heavy lifting. Appreciate your time to come out. Um, just again, ladies and gents, if you are as excited as we are about this investment opportunity, we do have this QR code that takes you to the expression of interest form. And the quantum that we ask you about in that expression of interest form helps us filter you into, will you be a part of the simple capital structure, go directly onto the B stack, or are you one of those investors that need to have the conversation directly with David in the negotiation uh, of your B shares? David, two questions that popped into my inbox, um, 
as we were talking, uh, and this is a little bit off piste, but but here we go nonetheless. So oh, let me see if I can paraphrase this because it came in the form of a paragraph here. Do you need to educate your customers in order to buy from you? Or do you find that they're um, open to this proposition that you're offering? In other words, the owning of the customer. Just talk to us broadly about your market experience in, in that space. Um, and then the second part, which I think is more a technical one, this is clearly from someone that's been in the sort of uh, SaaS uh, service selling in the past. Are you synced with your customers' technological roadmaps or are you like a major deviation for them to come onto your page? Let's deal with them in that order. So, yeah, initially, um, a couple of years back when we were starting the conversations, there was an educational thing. I think bank as a service wasn't really understood and embedded finance wasn't really understood, even though it was, it was all around us. Um, the concept and about what was now becoming possible because of technology and a provider like us that had solved the problem of how to deliver the value chain using the technology, there was an educational process. Today, um, people are much more aware of what's going on. Um, it's starting to happen all around them. Um, you know, you know, mobile network operators were providing mobile network operation service. They were providing a SMS and um, and voice. Uh, now they're offering nano loans. Now you're not mm. having that conversation anymore. Now it's like about how do we do this? We're a mobile network operator. We've got 25 million customers. Um, how can you give us something that'll scale? There's lots of people who do what you know who could give us. You know, well, actually, they're not a lot, but you can give us nano loans, but they can't scale because they're technology. And so that that education thing, um, no, we're 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 happily quite quite through that. Um, people really know what really know what they're doing there. Um, and then the second thing, I think you you, you spoke about the technology. Um, yeah, we've we've. Um, if, We've, we are where people want to go. So we're talking to enterprises that are got their CIOs and their CTOs, and they're saying, look, what does the future of our business need to look like? How do we modernize? What do we need to do? And everywhere they're looking, it's got to be APIs. It's got to be RESTful JSON APIs, not, not some middleware layer that's converting that you know, into SOAP but just something else in the socket mm. into a mainframe. They're saying, no, 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 we've got to get out of that world. The maintenance and support costs, we can't change those applications. We need to renew them. Um, so they're really moving into that world of event source, event streaming, microservices, domain-driven design. So this is what we do and where we are. And all of them, bar none, none have ever said, no, 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 don't need it, not necessary, don't want to go there, happy, want to stay on our mainframe. Um, no. <laughs> so we, we, that battle is, has been a long one, but, but that, 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 that corner is being turned. Okay, so it's great positioning, really, from a timing of where the macros have forced the world from a tech perspective and now what you offer. So the desire has been stimulated environmentally, and you essentially will be the square peg for the square hole, which is great. Um, there are three, there's a three prong question from AJ Kutsia. AJ from Rise in the Netherlands. AJ, uh, nice to see your name pop up on the private chat here. Um, David, there's, there's three questions here in one. It's Is there an application? or potential traction in first world countries, for instance, somewhere in Europe. Yes. Uh, duration of sales cycle on average, just to talk, you've touched on it, but just talk a little bit about, about that. Um, and then to your, I think it's your GN5 slide, I think prompted this, which is, would you not be required to get approved from every central bank where the system is deployed? Or is that again a jurisdictional play? Um, so first world traction, second sales yeah. cycles, third accreditation. Great, yeah. So great questions, AJ. Thanks. Um, obviously, not your first rodeo. Um, <laughs> so, absolutely, is there application or potential traction in first world? One hundred percent. It's still in its infancy. Um, embedded finance and bank as a service. There are more players and providers, but typically, what you'll find when you start to dig into those first world countries is that there you will find the people who are providing bank as a service are really the fronts for Visa and MasterCard and basically card and payment. Um, they don't have lending. Lending is very complex compared to payments. Payments is a velocity business. Um, lending is a complex business um, in my mind. 
So there's absolutely traction and investment accounts. You know, you're not going to find these guys that have got investment accounts. They've got all sorts of weird and wonderful rules and manners of, of, of how you're going to do those, redeem investments, et cetera, et cetera. So um, there's a lot of application, a lot of traction that you can get into first world countries. Um, average duration of sales cycle, I spoke about it a little bit earlier. Um, our fastest from signature to live was 30 days. Um, there was a greenfield, no data migration, none of that drama. Um, it was a startup business, um, SME lending. Um, they were actually financing motor dealerships. Um, they were like allowing like Audi to put down, you know, five different motor dealerships and they were the funders behind the motor dealerships. It wasn't Audi, but, um, and that was 30 days. Uh, our longest was three years. So you're really into organization by organization. We're talking to a global organization now. It's taken us about four months. You know, um, so it's really difficult. So these typical um, SaaS sort of retail type opportunities, like what's your CAC and your, you know, your your life, your LTV and all of these things, it's really difficult in enterprise sales. We don't have enough volume and traction to give any meaningful um, stats to those kind of numbers. And the sales cycles can vary. If I was to say, put put a pin on something, I would go on 12 months. Um, as a sales cycle. And then finally, do you get approval from every central bank? Um, yes, but it depends which area you're in. Um, there's been quite a lot of tightening in the US and Europe on fintech and bank as a service. There have been quite a few players that have behaved badly. So you need to make sure that as an organization, you've got your licensing compliance ducks in a row. Um, you know, so I'm busy going through, we've got several, what are called RE1. These are like reserve bank approved individuals, KIs, key individuals. Um, so we're going through a process and I'm, I'm writing exams shortly uh, for myself <laughs> to be one. Um, a lot of organizations don't want that pain and suffering. Um, yeah. I do. <laughs> um, I, I, I like that. Um, but yes, you are right. But in different jurisdictions, there's different licensing. You can get an EMI license in Europe and be able to do elements of this. Lending is regulated differently. You don't need central bank um, approval. And in most cases, you can get through this. Your key is get your first, get your first bank to go on that journey with you um, and go through a – it's basically the approval process is often, often let's go and work under supervision and let's get you integrated into the system. Once you've done that, you're done. So that's the general answer that I could give you. And region by region, there might be specific variances from that. Sure. Okay. Uh, AJ, thanks for the questions. David, I think what we'll do is we'll keep the WhatsApp group live, uh, let's say for a 10-day period or so. And if then more thoughts percolate to the surface based on the content that we've covered today, uh, users will have the opportunity to uh, circle yeah. back and perhaps ask some of these yeah. questions. Um, any closing thoughts from you as we head to the end of the conversation? Uh, perhaps something that you feel we didn't cover with sufficient depth um, that you think will excite investors or perhaps that there is an absolute necessity for them to know about or in the event of your feeling that we did cover sufficiently, I'm happy to close out. But just the final sort of opportunity to, yeah. to share um, if you want. I, th I think we have covered everything. Um, I, think, I think anyone looking at this just has to look at their own reality. Right. Just look at your own reality. Um, how is your interaction with your bank today? And how has your action interaction been with a brand where you've had to buy something and it hasn't been as seamless or frictionless as you want? If if that resonates with you and you say, mm, this, is, this isn't good, this isn't optimal, or like, sure, it would be so great if they just. If, if you can say that, then you should invest in us because we're solving that problem. David Rogers, the future of embedded finance and banking as a service. A privilege to spend time with you today. David, thank you for taking time out of your business to have this investor conversation with us. Uh, the QR code that we'll put on screen now, ladies and gents, is for you to be able to scan with your smart device and fall into this process of uh, expressing your interest in investing in this opportunity. And depending on the quantum that you put there for us, we'll be able to direct you towards the appropriate structure and or instrument uh, for you to be able to do so. That's it. We're out of time. David, thank you. Nice to see you yeah, again. Thank you. Um, Thanks everyone for joining. And all of the best on this investment journey as we spin along. And ladies and gents of the Simple Capital Investment Community, uh, nice to spend some time with you again and uh, may prosperity serve you until we speak again. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks, you. Courtney.